and it's chapter 17, with an emphasis on verses 6 and 7. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will stand before you on the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the psalmist wrote, I rejoice when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Now that our feet are within your gates, we rejoice to hear your word. As we listen, may your spirit enlighten our minds and move our hearts to love deeply as Jesus loved. As we pray to you, most holy trinity. Amen. On your next drive to Dallas, when you reach Denton, look left toward the University of North Texas, and you will see a larger than life-sized mural of UNP's most famous alumnus, and undoubtedly the greatest football player born in Texas, number 75 of the Pittsburgh Steelers, Bean Joe Green. <coughs> Today, Mr. and Mrs. Bean Joe Green lived with his six Super Bowl rings in a quiet community, Flower Mound, Texas, living good Christian lives. Well, why open a sermon titled, God Refreshes His People with Refreshment with Mean Joe Green? Two reasons. First, in the time it takes to drive from here to Dallas, Moses, if he had a bus and an interstate, could have driven across the Sinai to Israel. It's 200 miles. It don't take 40 years, even with traffic. <laughs> Second, because in 1979, Green starred in a Clio award-winning commercial for Coca-Cola that changed his life more than his helmet slapping stunt stance ferocity. In the commercial, a sheepish boy <coughs> offers an injured game of Coke, prompting Mean Joe to grab the bottle and guzzle the contents before turning to limp away. He then turns back Toward the now crestfallen child, smiles, and tosses his jersey with the famous punchline, Hey kid, catch. <coughs> the heartwarming commercial became immensely popular and made Green an international celebrity. 35 years after Tommy Oaken offered Mean Joe his Coke, kids still approach the steel curtain stalwart with theirs. <laughs> Tell me this. No one sells refreshment better than Coca-Cola. But no one refreshes better than our triune God. And so today we reflect on first, how God refreshed his people in the wilderness. Second, how God refreshes us with his word. And finally, how God calls us to refresh the world today. First, how God refreshed his people in the wilderness. After leaving Egypt, Moses did not travel east along the way of the Philistine, but turned south into the wilderness of Shur. After three days without water, they arrived at Marah, where the water was bitter. Here, scripture records, the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? As he was prone to do, Moses cried to the Lord, who showed him a law, which Moses threw into the water, and the water became sweet. This was the first of three times God provided refreshment to the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. Shortly thereafter, they camped at Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees. A few weeks passed, and again the people grumbled. Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, when we sat by our meat pots and ate bread to the people. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Hearing their complaint, God provided 
bread in the morning and meat in the evening. That brings us to today's meeting. The Israelites camped at Rabinim, an oasis in Sinai that provides enough water for large flocks and people. As Exodus records, however, there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses, give us water to drink. And Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Well, unsatisfied with Moses' inaction, the people grumbled, why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Moses then cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. We know that God provided refreshment once again when Moses struck the rock as commanded. But I have to ask, what is going on here? More than providing water and food for his people, God was initiating a relationship between himself and Israel with Moses as their leader. Bear in mind, God's people were in Egypt for 400 years before Moses led them out of slavery in Egypt. Who is God who led the people? Pharaoh. The Israelites were accustomed to a cruel, murderous leader who enslaved them and made life unbearable. As the nation's leader and God, Pharaoh did not hesitate to kill the Israelites when they were young. Now imagine that the only God you have ever known is a murderous slave driving tiger. And then along comes Moses, a prince raised in Pharaoh's house, a fugitive murderer who tended the flocks of a cultic priest in Midian. There he met Yahweh for the first time. And now he returns and talks about freedom in a land of milk and honey. You would be crazy not to follow him. You would be crazy to follow him. And his God, who promises faithfulness, mercy, and loving kindness. The Israelites could not believe that life could be different. They had no experience of a loving, merciful God. That God did not exist in Egypt. That is why the Israelites had such difficulty adjusting to Moses as their leader and Yahweh as their God. They were accustomed to this precarious existence. Is it any wonder why the Israelites had trouble entering into a faithful relationship with a God who not only responded to their cries as oppressed slaves and wandering sojourners, but also provided refreshment and protection. They grumbled out of desperation because they honestly believed that Moses led them into the wilderness to kill them. Well, one day, Israel would look back at Massa and Meribah, where they wondered, is the Lord among us or not? And realize he was. Having examined how God refreshed his people in the wilderness, we now turn to how God refreshes us. Most of us were raised in Christian homes by parents who taught us about a triune God. We attended worship and religious instruction on Sundays. Unlike the Hebrew slave under the oppression of Pharaohs, we live in a nation where most people know God's presence, mercy, and loving kindness. As we, we recognize means of grace as God's word and sacraments, namely holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. God refreshes us through his word, that is, scripture. Read the Bible daily, and you will undoubtedly find a passage where God promises you his presence, mercy, and loving kindness. My favorite is Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all who labor, and find life burdensome, and I will give you rest. Rest in God's presence. Rest in God's word. Baptism. When we were baptized, 
We were joined to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His paschal mystery sets the pattern and rhythm for our daily lives, strengthening and refreshing us. Confession. Most of us do not like to admit our faults, our sins, even to ourselves or our Savior. What God's Word says about our favorite vices may make us angry, ashamed, or afraid. However, God's call to repentance is one of love. God did not call the Israelites into the wilderness to kill them, but to love them. Absolution. For us, repentance or that rhythm of turning from Christ, from sin to Christ, is not some theological abstraction, but a concrete practice of Christian living. I need to hear. I forgive you of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit from my pastor. Pastors restart our crushed hearts with Jesus' words of ultimate love. I forgive you of all your sins. Holy communion. I need to be in a faith community that believes Christ is present under the elements of bread and wine. Eating and drinking his body and blood refreshes me. Through this sacrament, we experience God's love in the resurrected body and blood of Jesus in the bread and wine. One way we can ponder the refreshing power of this sacrament is to pray after receiving Holy Communion. These words are often printed in our worship guide. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you and I praise you that you have again refreshed me with the gift of your holy body and blood in this comforting sacrament. Bless my participation that I may, that I may depart from your presence with peace and joy in the knowledge that I am reconciled to God. I ask this in your name. Amen. And finally, God refreshes us through one another. Have you ever pondered how God calls you to refresh not only the people that you like, but everyone? So why is it that I greet some people with enthusiastic joy, but others with the same enthusiasm I feel when my doctor prescribes Miralax? Daily, God greets each of us with enthusiastic joy and renewed promises of faithfulness, mercy, and loving kindness. God visits us with refreshment. And so refreshed as God's people, we now ask how we might refresh the world today. Most people know I am not from Oklahoma. A couple of years ago, while working at World Neighbors, used to go around and give talks in churches about world papers. And one woman, after asking, where are you from, commented, you sure do talk funny. I'm not from here. But I can say that I was overwhelmingly impressed last spring on how Oklahomans and Lutherans responded to the victims of the tornado. To quote President Matthew Harrison, when disasters strike, we make an enormous difference by bringing our resources to bear where people are hurting. We strive to ease their hurt and bring refreshment through grace. All Christians should respond as we do. But to apply our theme drawn from the refreshing waters of Exodus, I want you to think for a moment about a population of people who, like oppressed Hebrew slaves, grew up not in a godly home but in an environment where God was absent. Twice in my life, I ministered to the incarcerated. My first experience was to men at Collins Correctional Facility in New York State, an exclusive gated community, whose motto was, you pull the crime, you do the time. <laughs> my second experience was at the Allegheny County Jail. I created a program for incarcerated mothers. Believe me, few experiences are as distressing and dispirited as meeting with incarcerated mothers. These women committed nonviolent crimes related to their addiction, theft, trafficking, solicitation, and so on. And they sorely miss their babies, their toddlers, their teenage sons and daughters. Like Hebrew slaves, 
They had grown accustomed to cruel people who made their lives miserable. Many of them grew up in harsh environments with no knowledge of, of God promising faithfulness, mercy, and loving kindness. My friend Lori Rosner and I designed Eye to Eye or Incarceration to Independence, where I went into the jail to see what these women needed before they went to court or, unfortunately, would have returned to their former lives and habits. The details I will save for another day. Suffice it to say that this is one way God calls us to refresh the world today. God does not call everyone to minister to incarcerated and addicted mothers or homeless men with mental health disorders. God knows, however, that there are many people in our world who sigh desperate cries of anguish that often fall on deaf ears. However, if we listen, we can hear them in our children's classrooms, in nursing homes, or just down the block. We can hear them from here, and we can minister to them. We can because God has visited us with refreshment, just as he did in the wilderness. <clears throat> when people in crisis wander in the wilderness, refreshed Christians walk alongside them. We strive to ease their hurt and bring refreshment through grace. As thirsty as we get, when we wander through life's wilderness, we realize that the Lord is among us. So, stay thirsty, my friends. Stay thirsty for God's refreshment, and you will meet the world's most interesting men and women. And when you do, may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.